church. And we thank you for the encouragement and the new life that your spirit brings. Would you give us ears to hear what you are saying to us today? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, good morning. You can take your seats. It's good to be with you today. Um, Stephen graciously uh, offered me the task to preach a Pentecost sermon, um, which is probably one of the most bizarre (laughs) um, events in Scripture. So thank you for that, Stephen. (laughs) I'll try to make sense of this. Uh, you Trinity Sunday. That's, he, that's true. That's true. I'm <laughs> counting my blessings. <laughs> Leave that one to you. Um, Pentecost is uh, such a awesome, bizarre, uh, really peculiar uh, day that we celebrate. And um, I think it can be a temptation for us to read the event of Pentecost and sort of just skirt over it because we're not really sure what to do with this bizarre experience that Acts tells us about. And so um, today, though, I believe that that uh, God can speak um, encouragement to us and uh, and a message of renewal to, to us as his church uh, this morning through this somewhat bizarre experience. So um, as I was preparing for my sermon, my Pentecost sermon, I came across some uh, Pentecost advice, if you will. So, uh, here it goes. In case of experiencing sudden Pentecost symptoms, if you find yourself suddenly caught in an indoor tornado with your scalp on fire, it might be Pentecost. Know what to do. Notify the front desk. Fight the urge to stop, drop, and roll, as you probably won't be putting out this fire that easily. And make disciples of all nations. Also, invest in a toupee. Besides, bald preachers are shady anyways. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cheeky. Um, but sure enough, uh, it is uh, no secret that this is somewhat of a bizarre event, but it is nonetheless incredibly important uh, to remember. As Stephen mentioned, it marks the birth of the church. Um, Pentecost is, I believe, one of the most significant um, occasions or celebrations um, that we can observe as, as a local church and also a, as a, a part of the greater church. Um, so Pentecost took place 50 days after the resurrection, and um, among other things that took place, what stands out mostly is that um, it marks the coming of the Holy Spirit when the disciples were filled um, with this Spirit. As we look back um, on that day, we are met with the very DNA of the church, the identity of the church, if you will. And this, I think, is particularly important for us today because oftentimes, as the church continues on through time and history, celebrating, worshiping, observing, and serving, um, going through seasons of fruitfulness and seasons of growth, Um, and also seasons of struggle and decline. Uh, This can be the cause of some discomfort um, or discouragement. And I think it does us a particular good to remember, to remember how the church started, to remember the identity of the church, and to draw encouragement and to draw um, hope uh, for our future. It is no surprise to anyone that during the past few decades, the church in North America has been in relatively steady decline. We are in in an age of what many refer to as post-Christendom. And it is in such a time as this that I believe it's of utmost importance and value to be reminded of God's call on his people, um, his purpose, and his plan for the church. And so today we remember the day when God breathed life into the church, when he brought newness, passion, purpose, encouragement, and empowerment to those who were waiting for the fulfillment of God's promise. Perhaps the church in North America, the Anglican church, um, more specifically the the church family of St. Matthew's, um, is in need of this new sense of hope and life and renewal that first brought the church um, life and um, encouragement to do what God had called them to do. 
So picking up where we left off last week, uh, before Jesus ascended into heaven, the last thing he leaves his disciples with are instructions to wait for the gift that the Father had promised. They were not to leave the city of Jerusalem until they received this. This promise would empower them to witness and to bring Christ's message to the ends of the earth. And presumably without this promise, without this one um, event taking place, they would not have that which was necessary for the church to come to life, for the church to grow. Um, The gospel needed to be brought to the nations. And so they waited. They waited and they prayed as Jesus had commanded. Acts 2 says they waited for the promise of the Father, and this promise was the Holy Spirit. Um, Growing up in the church, um, I've noticed something uh, sort of um, uniform in in all churches that I've been a part of or experienced in my 24 years, (laughs) which I suppose isn't long and doesn't really afford me that much experience, but nonetheless, um, is that sometimes uh, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is somewhat of a mystery to the church. And in some ways, we're not quite sure what to do with him, or, or in, in some denominations, we're not sure how to speak about him. And so sometimes the person of the Holy Spirit is sort of avoided or um, put to the side, if you will, because um, we're just not sure how to explain maybe uh, the nature as quite as easily as God the Father, God the Son. But we are met with the Holy Spirit all throughout the scripture nonetheless. He is at work in the lives of individuals um, and in, in bringing about God's plan. And so when we look to the Old Testament, we see that it was most characteristic for the Holy Spirit to be given to particular people for a particular task at a particular time. Consider a few examples in the Old Testament. I'm going to sort of pick a few of a few people throughout the Old Testament just by way of example. Bezalel in Exodus 31. God had filled Bezalel with the spirit um, for the ability to do works of craftsmanship, to make artistic design, and to engage in all kinds of craft work. God came upon Samson for power and for strength. 1 Samuel tells us of when the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, uh, setting him apart and anointing him to lead the people of Israel. Throughout Scripture, you see also uh, God calling uh, prophets, God putting his Spirit into these men and women to speak his word to the people. Ezekiel among, was among one of these prophets, Ezekiel went on to prophesy of the day that was coming when God would put his spirit in the hearts of all people and not just these particular people for a certain time or a certain task. Um, And so as we look in the Old Testament, we see that God's power, God's spirit brought power and purpose and boldness to those whom he had called. God's spirit brought wisdom and understanding and comfort to the lives of those he had filled. But it was for that time, it was for particular people, for a particular task. And as we go on through the Old Testament, we see almost this rising sense of anticipation. And the prophet Joel speaks of the fulfillment of this promised spirit that will one day be for all peoples. I know it was read earlier, but if I can um, just read a a brief um, excerpt from Joel's prophecy. And afterward, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And so we consider the amazing and transforming nature of this promise, that it will be for all people, that all people in the church will have access to this promise. This is regardless of gender and age. It is regardless of race, whether you are rich or poor, hurting or whole, timid or bold. This promise is for the strong and the weak. It is for those whose faith is barely that of a mustard seed, 
and for those faith who seem strong enough to move mountains. It was for everyone in the church. And this is a really beautiful um, and revolutionary, really, concept that all would have access to this empowering spirit. It is not just for pastors or priests or prophets or ministers, but every single person who would call themselves a member of the church, to them it is offered this spirit of empowering and boldness. I once heard of a a letter that a a pastor received, and it said this, Dear Pastor, there are 566 people in our church. 100 are frail and elderly. That leaves 466 to do all the work. But 80 of them are young people at school or college, so that leaves 386 to do all the work. But 150 of these people are tired business folks, and that leaves 236 to do all the work. But 150 of these are busy with young children and young families, which leaves only 86 to do all the work. But 15 live too far away to commute here regularly, so that leaves 71 to do all the work. But 69 say they've already done their bit for the church, and that leaves you me. (laughs) But I'm exhausted, so good luck to you. (laughs) The wonderful thing is that the Holy Spirit is for everyone, because everyone has a role to play in the mission of the church. Um, As we read today in Paul's letter written to the people in Corinth, he was uh, explaining to the church that the Spirit has given all kinds of gifts to those in the church. Some teaching, some serving, some uh, hospitality, all these different gifts that everyone has something to contribute to to share Jesus with the world. And uh, as we recall Jesus' last words to the disciples, he describes the work of the Spirit, the effect of this promise. Once they had received the Holy Spirit, they would receive power. And not just power for the sake of power or warm and fuzzies or a prestigious place of authority, but they would be empowered to bear witness to Christ, to this gospel message to bring the good news to a world that had not heard or known the life that Jesus brings. This spirit would give birth to the church, bringing life and purpose, equipping the church with the words to speak and the boldness and love to act in such a way that those around them would hear and would come to know Jesus. Here at St. Matthew's, this message and reminder seems particularly appropriate as we uh, seek to be intentional about sharing Jesus' love with our local community. We, um, as a church and as a part of the greater church, are reminded of our call, our purpose, to bear witness to those who have not heard yet, or even to those who have just wandered away for a little bit. We are reminded of our mission statement, sharing Jesus' love. Today we recognize that we are called to put time and energy into um, living in such a way that others may know from our lives, come to know the love of God. This includes our neighborhoods, our homes, our workplaces, our schools, our families. And as we consider this task... Uh, Pentecost reminds us that it is only by the Holy Spirit that we are able to do so. This morning we're reminded that in order for the church to be who and what God intended, they needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They needed the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We read later in Paul's letters, he's continually reminding the church, saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit. This was not meant to be just a, a one-time event, but that we, as, as the church, are called to be filled with the Holy Spirit and ever filled on an ongoing basis. So as we consider uh, this, this task of bringing the gospel to those who have not heard or sharing Jesus' love with our community and with our neighbors and friends, we recognize that it's no easy task. And it's actually um, oftentimes 
a little bit daunting and intimidating, I think, if we're honest, when we um, consider the risks, we, or um, we might fear, feel fearful or not strong enough, or maybe that we don't know enough, or, um, you know, that, that we can't do it on our own. And, and I believe that that's exactly where God wants us to be in that place of recognizing that on our own strength, we aren't able to do this, and that it's the Holy Spirit filling us that will um, equip us with the love and the boldness, the gentleness, and um, the ability to speak to others and to live by our actions in such a way that others would know, would know Christ. And this is why we need the Holy Spirit to witness, to speak, to act, and to share Jesus' love. And so as we remember and celebrate Pentecost today, may our hearts take on a similar posture of that of the disciples, of prayer. May we take time today um, upon remembering that everyone in the church um, is invited into this uh, mission and invited to participate in this, um, this gift, this promise of the Father. Uh, may we take some time and pray and open our hearts to welcome the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your Holy Spirit, especially in times of uncertainty um, and uh, and fear, honestly, um, we thank you that you um, promise to equip us and to not leave us as orphans, but that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit um, and empower us to do that which you have called us to do, to say that which you have called us to say, to live the lives that you have called us to live. Help us every day to be filled with your Holy Spirit, to live this life to participate in the mission of the church, to share Jesus' love with all those in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.